Alrighty, we're going to take a little look at uh, molecular and ionic compounds and their names and formulas, so a little refresher with that. First off, remember that molecular compounds are composed of molecules, all of which are alike. Um, and we typically represent or talk about molecular compounds being made of nonmetals only. Um, obviously, molecules are extremely small. For example, one billionth of a drop of water has one trillion molecules, which takes us into Avogadro's number, etc., etc. But the key thing about a, a molecular compound is its formula gives you the exact amount of the atoms of an element in the compound, okay, or in the molecule. So here we have CH3Cl. There is one carbon atom, three hydrogen atoms, and one chlorine atom all attached together with some covalent bonds. Even if we have a ginormous molecule like caffeine or sucrose, okay, where there's C11, H22, O11, I believe, 11 carbons, 22 hydrogens, 11 oxygens combined, it gives us how many atoms are actually combined in that molecule. And then in a sample of that molecular compound, there's lots and lots and lots of those molecules together. When we talk about molecular compounds, remember that some of our elements actually exist in nature as molecules. We have our seven diatomic molecules. And you may remember a phrase that to remember those, Hofbrinkel. Okay, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine all exist in nature as diatomic molecules. Another one that AP likes you to remember is the fact that sulfur likes to exist in groups of eight. Okay, so that pops up every now and then. Not that they expect you to have that memorized, but you see it a lot on a lot of different questions, so don't be shocked. So when we're naming molecular compounds and writing the formulas, this is where we need those prefixes. Okay, Molecular compound names have prefixes to tell us how many atoms are in the molecule. So when I see trisulfur octafluoride, you should hopefully know that that means there's three sulfurs and eight fluorines. I, I have given, or I will give you a little flow chart about naming compounds, but hopefully you remember all the molecular compounds end in "-ide". And if there's two vowels next to each other, as we'll see here in a minute, you know, you just try and write it slash say it as best you can without, you know, violating grammatical rules. Carbon tetranitride. If there's only one of the, one atom of the element at the beginning of the name, then we don't have to put mono in front of it. So carbon tetranitride is C and 4. It's not monocarbon tetranitride. So you can easily go the opposite way too. So if I have Cl2O6, the name of that molecular compound, two chlorines, so I'll use dichlorine, and then six oxygens, hexoxide. So yes, oftentimes we use hexa, but I wouldn't say hexaoxide. I just say hexoxide. PBr5, okay, again, there's only one phosphorus. I don't have to say monophosphorus. I just say phosphorus pentabromide. Of course, a whole branch of molecular compounds involving carbon organic chemistry has a much more complex nomenclature system, but that's for another day and time. Now for ionic compounds, okay, remember that our ions are electrically charged particles that we get when an atom gains or loses electrons. Our cations are positive, our anions are negative, and our ionic compounds are made of these cations and anions that are going to come together with ionic bonds. And their formulas are what we call formula units. It shows us the ratio of the ions. So for example, sodium chloride, its formula is NaCl. It's a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to chloride ions. We never find one sodium ion and one chloride ion in nature by themselves. We always find them in a nice crystalline pattern with multiple sodium and chloride ions arranged in a nice structure. But ultimately, there's a one-to-one -one ratio of those ions, so we just write NaCl. 
Our ionic compounds can be made of monatomic ions, which are simply elements that lose or gain electrons, atoms of the elements, of course, or our little groups, our polyatomic ions, where there's a group of atoms that come together, typically covalent bonded, but overall the group has either gained or lost some valence electrons. And so when we write formulas for ionic compounds, we want to show the ratio of the ions, and we want to show the lowest ratio. So of course, what's important to know is the charges of the ions. So for example, aluminum bromide, whether you have them memorized, or you look at the periodic table, or using an ion chart, but you should know that aluminum has a plus three charge as an ion, bromide is minus one. Aluminum is in group 3A, of the periodic table forms a plus 3 ion. Bromide is in group 7A or 17 with 7 valence electrons, so it gains one more to become bromide. Bromine becomes bromide. So I have to write the formula that puts them together in an effort to make a zero overall net charge. So I will need three of those bromides to counteract the plus 3 nature of the aluminum ion. Perhaps you've seen, or it's called like the crisscross method. If the charges are not equal and opposite, then it, the charge of the one ion tells you how many of the other you need. So one over bromide means I need one aluminum. Three over aluminum means I need three bromide. Copper two sulfide, of course those lovely Roman numerals tell us exactly what the charge is. So copper 2 means it's plus 2. Sulfide, sulfur, like oxygen, wants to gain two more valence electrons. So it has a minus 2 charge. Now here, since they are equal and opposite, I just need one of each ion to make a net charge of 0. Copper sulfide is CuS. It's not Cu2S2. Okay. So again, if the charges are equal and opposite, I put one of each together. If they're not equal and opposite, I can do the crisscross thing. Magnesium nitrate, magnesium in group 2 becomes plus 2. Nitrate, a friendly polyatomic ion that we probably know so very well, has a minus 1 charge. So again, two nitrates to go along with one magnesium. Iron 3 carbonate, 3 means irons plus 3. Carbonate, another polyatomic buddy. I'm going to need 2 of the irons to go along with 3 of the carbonates. And so that'll look a, something like that. So again, that's the writing of the formulas. As far as naming is concerned, you can see the different names that we used here. And again, you can use that flow chart for a reference for now if you need as you're practicing. But here I have BAO, all right, barium oxide. And that's all it is because barium is what we call an A element. It can only form traditionally a plus two ion. So I don't have to indicate anything more than that because barium is always going to be plus two. Oxide is always going to be minus two. So when you tell a scientist barium oxide, we know that it's just BAO because they're equal and oppositely charged. Potassium is K. It can only form a plus one ion. And then PO4, you need to recognize as your polyatomic ion, phosphate. So that becomes potassium phosphate. MnSO4. All right. Mn is manganese, not magnesium. Manganese is a transition element. It's in the middle of the periodic table in the D block. Those elements can typically form more than one type of ion. So those are the type of elements we traditionally need to differentiate, either with a Roman numeral or a classical name like manganus or manganic, if you've used those before. How do you know which ion it is? Because you typically know the charge of the anion it's attached to. Okay, again, those transition metals are always the positive ions. So sulfate, you should know and remember, is a minus 2 charge. 
Well, since I have one manganese and one sulfate, I know that this manganese must be a plus 2 charge. And so that's why this is manganese 2 sulfate. Classically speaking, manganese 2 is manganese sulfate. If manganese was in the plus 4 form, it would be manganic sulfate. The OUS ending goes with the lower charge. The IC ending goes with the higher charge. And then we have AgCl. Of course, chemistry is the wonderful world of exceptions. So Ag is silver, Cl chloride. Silver, however, is a transition metal, but we traditionally know and recognize that silver only forms a plus one charge ion. And so this is simply known as silver chloride. You don't need to differentiate with a Roman numeral because chemists know that silver will traditionally only form a plus one ion. I hope this refresher helps, and I wish you luck on your quick check on chemical formulas and names. Later.